Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the ADNET's Early to Commit Career Researcher Accelerator Group, I'd like to formally welcome everyone to this workshop on navigating a career in dementia research. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which this workshop is held and the land on which our attendees are joining from and pay respects to our elders past, present and emerging. That's our program for today. So um, the workshop is conducted in two parts. Uh, in our first part, we'll have our um, talk by our guest speaker, and that will be followed by a panel discussion. The second part will include um, breakout room sessions where um, uh, the uh, it's a it's like a networking event, and you get to share your experiences and take some advice from our expert uh, and the panelists. Um, I will now um, ask uh, Associate Professor Nadika Disnayaka to introduce the Accelerator um, Group. Thank you, Tejal. I'm Nadika Disnayaka from the University of Queensland, and I have the privilege to co-chair the ADNET Accelerator Group uh, together with Professor Lee Fei Lo from University of Sydney. Um, the ADNET Accelerator Accelerator Group supports and advocates for early and mid-career researchers in dementia and helps develop leadership um, in dementia research. We conduct numerous webinars, uh, workshop as the one today, uh, surveys, sponsorship program, pairing mentors and mentees, and we also maintain a regularly updated dementia grant opportunities database. All our information can be found in the ADNET uh, website under the researcher tab. Recordings of webinars, including this workshop, can be, can be found under the ADNET website resources tab. We currently have 12 members from all over the country. I'm just going to get um, everybody to turn on your camera and I'll introduce all our members. Uh, firstly, uh, we got uh, to an, uh, so we got Edwin Tan here, who is one of the members who's been here for a while. Uh, Tuan Nagwin and uh, Suraj Samtani, Lee Fellow, Stephanie Wong. Yes, Suraj. Thank you, Stephanie Wong. We also have a few members who couldn't make it today. Julian, uh, Asia, uh, Celia, and Claire Burley. So I would like to thank all our members of the, of the team for all the hard work they do throughout the year. And of course, the organizers today, Tejal and Stephanie, um, who are conducting this workshop. And thanks also to Adnet for their support and especially the support provided by the ADNET team, um, Matilda Busco. We welcome um, new members to our group. So if you are interested, please get in touch with Stephanie and provide your expression of interest. So in your email, please state why you wish to be a member of our team. And, um, and we do welcome new members to our, our team. Thanks again for all the attendees today. And now I'd like to hand over to Tejal to continue with the workshop. Thanks very much. Many thanks, Radhika. I would like now. Uh, I would now uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Stephanie Wong um, uh, to provide an overview of this workshop. Stephanie. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, uh, yeah, so welcome to the workshop. I'm Dr. Stephanie Wong. I am a NHMRC Research Fellow and Clinical Neuropsychologist here at Flinders University in Adelaide. Um, so yeah, welcome to the workshop today. So um, in terms of our overall aims, um, we really hope to um, understand um, from our research leaders and rising stars in the field how to successfully and strategically progress in uh, the research field in dementia. And we also really hope this to be an opportunity for Australian researchers in the field at the kind of early to mid-career stage to really get to know each other and um, be able to relax 
uh, and network um, in this environment. Um, of course, because the um, the conference was held virtually, we weren't able to network in person, but hopefully this will be um, a, a good kind of placeholder. Um, so yeah, so with that um, note, I'd firstly like to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Professor Belinda Goodenough. So I'm just going to pop the spotlight on Belinda so we can see her. Here we are. Hi, Belinda. So yes, Professor Belinda Goodenough is a behavioral scientist with 20 years of experience in the fields of psychology, education, and health services research. So she has a specific interest in translating knowledge and implementation research, um, and with the, the real goal to improve our understanding of how, how the real world can get the best value from our research investment. So Belinda has applied these skills in areas that are quite diverse, so including pain, cancer, childhood health, um, and over the past decade, really focusing on aging and dementia. So she's the executive director for Dementia Training Australia. So most of her work involves developing and disseminating resources to help support the workforce and lead innovation and change. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Belinda, but before we do that, I'll also let you know that um, you can pop in any questions in the chat box. So I'll be monitoring that throughout today um, and there'll be um, a chance for Q&A with Belinda um, after she finishes her talk. All right, over to you, Belinda. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I almost recognised myself in that introduction. That was lovely. Um, but my background, if you were seeing me before, that was a screenshot of the Illawarra region, very windy place today, but that's uh, south of Sydney, uh, about an hour and a half's drive away. Okay, so thank you so much for providing this uh, topic, which is in inverted commas, because you chose it, not me. Uh, would you trust this face to actually give you experience and advice? Let's hope so. Um, I'm going to uh, just give you a whistle stop tour, which includes thanking you, first of all, for the topic, because it makes me feel like I've reached that um, would you like a bus seat type part of my career journey where I'm old enough to be given some sort of uh, different privilege. Uh, so thank you all for offering me the bus seat. Let me see if I can actually uh, do that justice. Now, my two hats. Uh, elegantly described by then by Stephanie. The one I'll be mainly talking to is the top one, Executive Director of Dementia Training Australia. And if you attended a uh, talk yesterday, you would have heard a, a shameless advertorial for about a minute to introduce people to that. But there is another one that I, I, I have at the moment, which got nothing to do with dementia really, and is uh, a linked data platform. But it does mean that I, I understand the social care research side of things. I understand population health research and big data. Um, and I have limited research in the laboratory, but more about that in a tick. Um, because first of all, I want to fondle your feather. Um, and by that, I mean, do you know the percentage of, percentage of people who actually have a PhD? Um, I'm assuming most of the um, audience on this particular workshop probably have a PhD or are working toward one or at least can giving it serious consideration. On average, only 1% of the entire world's population of 20 to 64 year olds who've even been to university also have a PhD. And to put Australia into that context, this is from the OECD education at a glance. Um, this shows you the top countries. Don't know what's happening in Slovenia, 5%. That's, and that's the star performer. Australia is actually sitting slightly above average at 2%, and maybe all we care about is that we beat New Zealand. Uh, but it's an interesting, very low statistic, because in Australia, at least, even if you do the rough maths using population estimates from last June, where 6.8 million of people living in Australia in that 25 to 64 year old bracket, and not all of them have been to university. So let's just take the 2% there. We will have no more than 100,000 people who have got a PhD, which puts you right in the rare breed category. There's more emus in Australia than there are people who hold a PhD and uh, probably slightly more than the lyrebirds. But it does mean that as an Australian with a PhD, you are a valuable national investment. You have a small pool of peers, meaning you've also got a small pool of comparison groups. And you have really an atypical and constant exposure to the novel, to the original, to the esoteric. And 
brings with it a certain vulnerability to uh, what I would call imposter syndrome. And it also means that many of you with a PhD have to reestablish your relationship with rejection because uh, there's plenty of it. Um, and it's important to hold on to that idea. As I was saying yesterday, ideas are important that you aren't the idea uh, because rejection is a lot harder. And there'll be lots of times where as you progress and particularly as you become a leader, you'll be asked to present an argument. And you need to, need to be really aware of ad hominem argument style, especially if aspiring to lead. And by that, I mean, sticking to the facts, detachment for an idea, rather than attacking the person. And Twitter, unfortunately, is a breeding ground for ad hominem arguing. So it's just something to be aware of, that as we mature and grow as scientists and become leaders, we have to know how to um, develop sound log logic and, and work with facts. I am part of the 2%. My special subject used to be gnomes. Uh, this is me at the age of about one. I don't know what I was up to, but I'm told I was very fascinated with little men with pointy hats. Uh, I doubt I was really thinking about knowledge translation at this idea. And by birth, I am English. I have to confess, not Australian, born in a little dot of a place called Kidderminster in the middle of uh, the West Midlands of England. Um, we emigrated to Australia. Good enough is my family name, the one I was born with. And yes, my parents did give me a name with the initial B. So I've been B good enough all my life. Heard all the jokes. I enjoy them all. But when I hit, hit Australia, I did get a new one, which was she'll be right that I was told I had to change my name because Australians don't use the name good enough. Kind of funny. But I'm a first in family. So I do not come from uh, a lineage of scientists or or academics in any form. Uh, so their understanding of what a PhD was and what it was for and how to become a leader post, uh, very, very different sort of a world. So in terms of understanding where my advice and experience might be coming from, I thought it would be good to do at least a quick map of how I got to be where I am now. And I thought, this is a really interesting exercise reflecting on, on your life. Um, and I tried to break it down into categories, as you can see on the left. So I'm going to build a table with you here. But where I was, the qualifications that I did at the time, the research themes I was into, uh, whether I was in practice in any form, teaching and supervision, uh, policy directions and other sort of review and other types of tasks. There's a lot that happens in one person's life. And I, I'm not going to bore you with, with this as a map. It's just going to help me make some trigger points. Where I started has nothing to do with dementia, really. Um, I did a PhD at UNSW, and I was in psychology because I wanted to do psycholinguistics. I wanted to find out how children learn to read. Uh, ridiculous question, really. No one can ever do that. Um, but as things developed, I ended up getting further and further away from psycholinguistics. And my PhD was in the area of visual perception, which was how we see the world. I did a lot of work on things that aren't there, which is actually illusions, even teaching at, at all levels um, in psychology around visual perception, things like subjective contours. There is no white triangle on the left there or a black triangle on the right. They are per all generated by the fact that there are other pieces in the image that are giving clues to your visual system that there really is a surface there with lines. It's only so long you can do this for and if there is one word you'll learn today, it can be enfalloskepsis, which is another word for navel gazing. I did a bit of that early on. I thought, is there more to life than sitting in a black windowless lab, researching, teaching things that actually aren't there? And I got my answer fairly quickly. Within the first year after completing my PhD, I decided I had to get closer to the real world, even a backward step, because a PhD is pretty overqualified for most research jobs that were being advertised at the time. So I jumped from university into hospital. I became a hospital scientist. So I moved from the academic sector and I worked, went and worked in pediatric pain for a long time, uh, particularly areas of measurement, because at that point in time, if, it, if a PhD researching things that may not be there was relevant to anything, it was actually helping the uh, healthcare workforce understand another phenomenon they thought wasn't there, which was childhood pain. And even if it was there, how would you measure it? I also developed an interest in humor at that stage as to how people cope with, with pain post-surgery. Practically, I was doing much more things aligned with a clinical career. So I, I did actually register as a, a practicing psychologist 
and um, was involved in the chronic pain service. I was still involved with UNSW doing student supervision and starting to generate sort of a, a pathway where I was reviewing papers. But after a while, it became clear that the group I was involved with was always strapped for cash, hospitals are. And I was on a, a hamster wheel of constantly writing grants. And I thought, is there more to life than writing grants to keep oneself employed to write grants? It, it didn't seem very... Uh, plausible as a lifelong sort of occupation. So I decided I need to be part of a bigger team and build a program of new applied ideas. So I stepped sideways from pain and moved into the cancer area, taking pain with me, of course, because pain is obviously a symptom uh, in the cancer space and set up a new program there, which is all about psychosocial um, issues in uh, cancer, including bereavement, uh, still was doing things on the side in a practice sense. You'll notice at the top there, yeah, hypnosis. Yes, I trained in hypnotic um, techniques and I was doing a lot of Im imagery work with kids. Um, I was still teaching in health psychology and I was doing things like taking students on field trips and so on. And that was progressing quite well until I had my personal spokes of Venus moment. And I am referring, of course, to the keynote I gave yesterday, um, which... What happened really was that there was a project I was working on, on out-of-pocket costs for parents uh, who were looking after a, a, an unwell child. Um, about 30%, of course, of our patients were dying and many had to come to Sydney from country areas for treatment. And I got chased down the corridor in a hospital one day, bailed up by a mother in the lift who said, can I use your publications on out-of-pocket costs in court and I said, what do you mean? And I was really worried. I thought I was in trouble. She said, no, I'm divorcing my husband and he doesn't realize how much it costs when you've got a child sick with cancer and I want to tell the judge and you've got the data. And the reason why this was a real uh, watershed moment for me is because I had never thought of how the publications I was producing and I was producing a lot. And I seemed to be on this train of... Uh, uh, proving my worth by writing papers all the time and some of them were taking ages um, to be published and then I put them up on a wall so people could come and look at them. I never thought that I could actually contribute back into the system something of value. The writing of papers had taken on a life of itself. I was totally naive about practice impacts, policy directions, you name it. I was so embarrassed that I had never ever thought of taking that work on out-of-pocket costs and actually helping the parents and the families at that time uh, with the benefits and the outputs of that, it really has lived with me ever since. Um, so I decided, gosh, is there more to life than publishing papers to stick on my wall? And I decided that in order to get to an answer to that question, I needed to get comfortable leading an applied journey for knowledge and probably based on someone else's idea. And this is how I ended up in the dementia space because I applied for a job and it was working with Lee Fei Lo on the SMILE study, which appealed to me because it was uh, going backwards in time to my humor connections. Because I knew that if I needed to take a, a, the kind of translational track for my career and build leadership in that space, I'd first of all have to get comfortable with not owning the original knowledge. And that was quite an insight back then. I'm quite proud of myself they even thought that way. So the verdict was it was quite an intense and an amazing study, and Lee Fay can tell you all about it some other time, but um, I was comfortable with not owning the idea. I was more comfortable with working with dirty data because where I'd started in a laboratory, it's very precise. I was writing computer programs and driving all kinds of reaction time tasks. Precision is the order of the day. I then had to get comfortable with real-world data I also had to get comfortable with converting science into lay. There's a lot of stakeholder engagement in that particular project, talking to people in residential aged care and the people living in care themselves. Now, at this point, I was already 10 years or more post PhD. That's important to know. Now, that, that particular project had own, its own life because it was uh, funding, um, Come, coming to a conclusion. But one of the things that was unusual about the SMILE study is that it almost self-implemented. It didn't, didn't have such a, a ratty journey on the translational space as others, partly because the politicians were promoting it before we'd even published the papers. And I didn't think that that was probably the usual way things would happen. It was a great way, 
but it wasn't the best way, perhaps. And I wondered, is there more to life than the researcher politician view of translation impact? And I figured I needed to get experience outside university or care setting to improve understanding, particularly of the policy space. So from that point, the next thing I did in my career is I went completely outside university and hospital setting with my research skills. And I joined the Sachs Institute for a couple of years. And I trained as a knowledge broker there. I started looking after a uh, very large, big, big linked data platform, which was the 45 and up study. So it was much more generic about aging um, than, than dementia. And what I learned there was an awful lot of things, but I also learned something about the fact there seems to be two cultures operating and the worlds of practice and policy don't often talk to each other. So I thought there must be more to life as a researcher than just constantly navigating this chasm and trying to find ways of, of bridging that gap. But I felt quite confident by that stage that I'd learned enough to give proper KT a crack in a domain that I felt really deserved a boost and so I went back to UNSW and, and applied to uh, be looking after the knowledge translation program there, which is actually a bridge spanner role between UOW and the old Dementia Training Study Centre and UNSW, um, where, where the research was coming to life. Um, I was not at all in practice at this stage. I was still doing some knowledge brokering on the side, which was a way of actually bringing um, health policy and ministerial uh, units in contact with evidence reviews. So I was still doing that as a casual. And I was wearing a lot of hats, more hats than I had ahead. And that that in and of itself with the demands, you know, I still had a life. I, was, I had a child. I ha had all of those sorts of things in there. You start to get to the point where you think, if I'm going to progress, which hats am I going to let go? So I thought it's time to build and lead something whopping big. And that's where I am now with um, UOW. I'm now with the um, sort of in that training space, I suppose, which is a genuine, how do we make research, uh, make a difference uh, in the right directions. In this period of time, I've completed my own uh, master's in implementation science because I did that sort of late when I decided what, what I'd like to do that on. Besides those degrees didn't exist back in the day. Um, and this is a very, very, very big program. So um, started off with little grants right back here, and I'm now managing what will be um, the, the new incoming grant, which is a $66 million program. So we've gone from little to big quite rapidly. So as I mentioned, back in the day, my PhD and my child are pretty much the same age. Uh, a lot of the stuff I did before all the niceties of the internet and LinkedIn and Facebook and iPhones and Twitter even existed. I keep thinking, would I have done it differently if I'd had those tools? Uh, the National Institute for Dementia Research uh, was toward the end there. And then, of course, we've got COVID. So that's the sweep of some punctuation marks. And the question you might be asking, is my map of how you would build leadership and get from little to big um, typical? Is it unusual? Is it helpful? Should it never be repeated by any sentient, rational human being? Well, just to put some things into perspective, one thing I want to say is that career and job change is normal. I did a lot of it. Um, there are job mobility statistics that are released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And they've had a particular flavour for the past year. They released this annually. Um, we've, we've had the largest job mobility rate since 2012 in Australia. Um, and the biggest share of the mobility um, includes professionals. You, if you prefer graphs to uh, words, professional includes scientists. We are they, researchers. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of us have changed jobs in the last 12 months. Uh, probably because the university said your services are no longer needed, perhaps, uh, but it's still pretty high, um, given that we've still got new entrants in the last 12 months. So there is a lot of uh, shifting around and it's seen as a normal thing. And I wonder if you know how long is the average career? Well, you've got about 90,000 hours to fill in if you're gonna be hanging in a career for about 50 years. The average age that people change careers is about 39. So if you're not there yet, look out for the niggle. 
Uh, how many jobs will the average person have in their lifetime? Well, the average is 12. Now, these are data that are really coming from US sources because they're the most recent ones I could find, but I think the situation would be quite similar in Australia. It diminishes with age. The older you get, the less likely you are to change jobs. But, but 12 is, is a, a pretty reasonable number. I don't know if it includes my early things, like when I started off in Kmart, which I did. And many of us start off with a particular major or a theme in mind, particularly our education. But by the time we get to our current job, we may or may not be using it. And I'm one of those, I think. I'm part of the 15% is pretty much not using what I, what I train to do, either in the method or the topic. But I think the approach, the scientific mindset is something that stays with you. So I'm going to first of all suggest that a job and a career definitely aren't the same thing and stepping backwards and sideways is more than okay as long as you can explain it. For example, to an interview panel, to a grant reviewer, even to a five-year-old. Um, seeking out and developing leadership oriented opportunities I think is one of the best reasons for explaining why you went sideways or somewhere else in your path because most of what we do we, we aren't on linear trajectories. It, it just doesn't quite work out that way. And for me, this topic that I was given has probably got words missing on the end because experience and advice on becoming a leader in dementia research, I would put translation or something at the end because a lot of what I do now isn't usual research. It might be program evaluation, uh, but my, my research hat is quite limited and different uh, to, to most folk. Uh, and my reflections on ingredients of success, well, first of all, staying in touch with core values. My fridge look, tends to look like this. I hate waste. I like to see a good return on investment, including the animals and plants that died for my belly. And I wonder what your core values might be. Uh, is it inclusivity? Is it diversity? Is it precision? These are probably important to not have them drift too far away as you make your job choices and step through the options. I think it is one way of keeping the imposter syndrome in check to some degree. I also put effort into to developing the value adds, and I would recommend that um, several of you think similarly. There are always skills that are in high demand, but in short supply. I found a niche. I was thinking about knowledge translation before it had formal courses, before it became a commodified word in the vocabulary. And I did something about finding ways to, to equip myself to provide that value add. But there are other types of value adds. It may be if you work in a laboratory, there's a specific technique you're aware of that not many other people know about, but you're willing to become the expert in. Health economics is a big one on grants. Everyone needs a health economic person, but hardly anyone can do it well. But there's other skills too, just being able to manage a project well, being able to develop logic models, program evaluation, knowing more than a smattering from Google about epidemiology. Um, I've learned a lot about big data and linked data management over the years due to putting myself out of my comfort zone and, and in jobs that that's required. Uh, but there's other stuff too that, that teams um, require support in. Maybe you've got a hankering to do better in communications and marketing websites. Uh, some people love research governance or contracts. Business skills are never go far awry, particularly if you want to become a leader. You need to know how to read financial statements and all of that. And what about just adding a whole different science to your kit? Because that's what I did. I thought, well, what is this implementation science? Let's get better at it. But maybe co-design or action research or citizen science is, is an option. So I'm going to say that putting effort into developing a value add um, and sometimes becoming a big fish in a small pond can be useful in your career trajectory and also for becoming a leader. It also is important to know how to describe that value add. Um, because if you can't describe it, no one else is gonna be able to describe it for you. We're not very good at putting the spin on our own achievements and make, making the right kind of language for the right kind of audience, but it's important. Lifelong learning, learning also really is lifelong. If you were following that Qualls line on my, my map of myself, you would have noticed I had a PhD. I did the bits to get my professional registration sorted. It's now lapsed because it doesn't really offer anything. So that was just a period of about 10 years. Uh, I did a 
bit of tinkering around here. I then trained formally as a knowledge broker. So I knew what I was doing in this space with policy. I did executive leadership training also to prepare myself for a step up if required. And um, I also completed a master's through King's College London. That was expensive, took a lot of time. I had to to and fro from the UK to do it, but I did it. So lifelong learning, learning really is lifelong. And I think you need to understand your leadership vision to know what's the right path for you. I'm going to posit there's a difference between being a leader of research and being a research leader. Both are important. There's room for all, but knowing where you're pitching is important. Uh, one of the differences is that a leader of research needs to know about precision, will be in the weeds, be in the everyday ops. A research leader needs to know about the horizon and the big picture. Leaders of research, you need good project management skills. Research leaders, you want to be able to manage ideas. Uh, leaders of research, you need to manage people. In research leaders, you need to have that team assembly uh, sort of logic and how to network. There's often talk about what's the difference between a boss and a leader. You know, bosses, you know, uh, whip and leaders pull. Um, in university settings, I've seen this one, that the leader of the group tends to be pulling the whole cart. Um, but there are differences between being a boss and a leader and the type of leader you want to be. Um, I think common to both is an understanding of governance. A core skill, if I can impress it upon you, if you want to be a leader, know how to run meetings and the etiquette of meetings, learn how to chair, find opportunities to chair, how to set agendas, how to prepare meeting summaries. I am in a lot of meetings and they drive me mad when they don't really achieve anything or I run pretty poorly. Um, so that is a skill, no matter what I think you need. And I think also stakeholder engagement, Core skill, understanding the non-PhD and lay worlds, uh, learn how to communicate, how to do an elevator pitch um, so that you put the right spin on what you're doing. This document here might be useful for some of you to pick up. Um, it's written by the Canadian group. It helps you understand relationship with search from a stakeholder point of view. And how long does all this take to actually get to a point where you, you would feel that um, you're making progress? This, this diagram comes from an actual published paper, which I'll um, point out to you. And it is showing how many years it takes to get from PhD through all of those steps to being a senior research leader. Women take a little bit longer to get to leading a team, but they seem to beat men when it comes to being a research leader. Go figure. That's from that paper here. You can read it yourself. So there are paper, people who study this. And so, Thank you for uh, giving me the bus seat. If you want some opportunities to practice some things, dementia um, space in, in Australia, the Journal of Dementia Care gives lots of opportunities for early career researchers who can actually improve their profile. It's read by the Department of Health and the sorts of things I need from anyone in research is short articles on state of the art, whether it's neuroscience, therapeutics, lab work, et cetera, being able to explain what's going on to people who are on the front line and carers um, is really helpful. I keep asking what happens to those literature reviews that people write at the front end of their grants that never get published? Surely there's something that could be recycled and repurposed. Um, we've got things that then become read then quiz. So they actually become part of the CPD, the continuous professional development for professionals, which is a bit of a string to your bow when you're writing a track record. And we've got lots of roles that, that you know, even if you want to become more involved and sit on the editorial board. Um, watch this space. I talked about de-implementation yesterday. I'm keen to set up more opportunities for researchers who actually want to look at a, a career path or a career track through there. I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but, but watch it anyway. So in summary, moving forward and moving upward, it's not always linear. Uh, avoid burning your bridges. I went out and then came back. It's possible. It probably makes you a better researcher if you do. Keep learning, including the boring courses your employer offers, even the admin ones to become an evacuation warden. It shows aptitude, it shows um, willingness, it shows all the things that make you visible. Think systemically. Look at how organizations work, how sectors and systems interact, what kind of leader needs to be across that and to be able to lead in that context. Stay authentic. Don't forget gratitude and humor. As a simple example, replace apologies with a thank you. It's one thing to say, sorry, I'm late. 
think about saying thank you for waiting. These are the hallmarks that make it easier to lead people, establish rapport and get you to where you, you really want to be. And finally, lead from where you are. And I'll leave you with this cartoon. Don't wait for someone to tell you a leader. Find out what you can do in the place that you are. All right. Well, that was a whistle-stop tour um, of me. It feels so self-indulgent talking about myself. But <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Belinda. I, I think I'm reading through all the comments from everyone and everyone's loved your talk so far. And, yeah, I think a lot of us can definitely um, identify with uh, what you said about having more hats than you had head. <laughs> ah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, it, it's... It's a difficult thing now for people to say that was terrible because they're going to say that half of my life was terrible. So it's, <laughs> what can people say but positive? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it's definitely a very inspiring journey. And yeah, I've just had a look through some of the questions for you so far. And um, I think someone mentioned that it feels like um, today's EMCRs somehow have to be good at all of these things, but actually it's about having a team that can work together to cover these things together and kind of guide you. But at the same time, do you think there are any downsides of working in a large team, in particular when you're trying to lead your own independent um, research studies? Oh, I'd say definitely. You could ask that same question in a different context about people who are only child versus though that those that have 11 siblings. <laughs> There's going to be pluses and minuses to any congregation of human beings. And, and because those of us who have a PhD really have come through a system where we were always uh, probably close to the top of the, the pile, Mm -hmm. We did well at school, we got selected, we might have got scholarships, we did all of that. So you've got a bit of sibling rivalry that goes on. And some of that can spark better ideas. So you end up with something that is better than all of you could come, come from, or you might feel a bit gazumped and overlooked, particularly if your personality is on the introverted side, because research does require a good reductionist analytic mindset. It tends to travel with that personality type that is quite happy to keep to themselves and not be so flamboyant or um, whatever it is. So there definitely are downsides if you um, don't enjoy being part of that, that crowd and that, that energy. Mm. Um, that question might have been coming from a, another angle. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think there's more yeah, pluses than great. minuses myself. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, okay, so I might ask one more question um, and then sure. we might have to move on to the panel discussions, but you're part of the panel discussions anyway. I am. Continue with that. But um, I did have a question from Monica who says, Belinda, you've been a real trailblazer in knowledge transmission <laughs> and implementation science in aged care and dementia care. So you're, you've been responsible for sparking her interest in the field and I'm sure many others as well. Her question is, how did you know that this field would be the next big thing? So are we as ECRs meant to anticipate where the field will go? Like, do you have a crystal ball or something? Well, that's that's a really uh, astute question, Monica. And may I return the compliment? I've been following your career with interest and the things you've been doing on Agents of Change. It's all terrific stuff. Um, obviously, my story began with a, a, a deep-rooted dissatisfaction with um, being on the various hamster wheels I'd found myself on. And um, I guess I popped up my head and dared to look around to figure out, well, what's the frequent complaint from the coalface where research is supposed to be making a difference? So it, it seemed to me that the translational question just kept popping up in different forms and in different ways. So I probably got lucky and it's some of your career is how you manage your luck. Um, it's not a bad idea if you can be aware of what, keep doing that horizon scanning. And horizon scanning, I think, is a feature of a, a leader's mindset, is that you're not just staring at your desk, um, but you are actually trying to read the signals. Um, some of that reading signals is going to come with putting yourself in forums that are more uh, diverse, I think, than scientific conferences. Mm -hmm. um, so if aligning with what peak bodies are telling telling us um, that sort of group I think so if you can turn up to those sorts of things or even organize a summit where the, where the getting those peripheral people together with with scientists can sometimes be more helpful and then look at the keywords that pop up I wish I had a a, a clever answer to that that's more clever than that but um, uh, I can just sort of encouragements and sometimes just hook your trailer to someone who's 
who you think um, is worth having a chat with, always be the first yeah. to actually say, John, a cup of coffee, I'll even buy you a sandwich. Um, in well, yeah, that yeah. Work. well, Monica says that's pretty clever. So, <laughs> your response there. Okay. Um, okay, so just in the interest of time, we might move on to introducing the panelists. Um, I know Emily had a question about moving from bench to um, bedside, but I think that would be good for um, uh, our panelists as well. So, we can um, just hold that thought. Okay, so um, I might just, sorry, I just need a spotlight for our panelists. Um, I'll just invite our panelists to switch on their cameras. Um, if our panelists could all pop their cameras on, that would be good. <laughs> Okay, so I think we have everyone here. So we have a, a wonderful panel of um, uh, experts in the field to um, talk to us today. So um, we, yeah, we really aim to bring together senior researchers and rising stars within the um, Australian dementia field to really chat about different aspects of career progression and, and leadership. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Uh, I'll just go through a quick introduction of everyone. So of course we have Professor Goodenough, um, but we also have Associate Professor Tuan Yuan. Who, uh, who was an NHMRC ARC Dementia Research Development Fellow, but now he's currently a Principal Research Fellow at NARI. Um, he's also an Associate Professor at the School of Health Sciences in Swinburne, um, University of Technology, um, and an adjunct um, at UniSA. So hi, Tuan, welcome. Um, Next, we have um, Honorary Associate Professor Catherine Guzzi, who um, holds a honorary position at Macquarie University. Um, and she's also the CEO and Director of Cara Mines, uh, which is a clinical trial facility in Macquarie Park, which was founded in 2015. So hi, Catherine, and thank you for joining us. Uh, next on our panel, we have Associate Professor Tracy Coleman, who is a UQ Amplify Fellow in the Centre for Health Services Research at UQ and also an adjunct research fellow at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. So hello, Tracy. Yep. And uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Suraj Samtani, um, one of our um, Accelerator Group members. Um, Suraj is a postdoc fellow at the Centre of uh, for Healthy Brain Aging, or Chiba. So can I just ask each of our panel members to give a short introduction, um, including the background um, and a bit about kind of career highlights and key turning points. Um, I might just go in, back in that order that we had before. So maybe we'll hear from Tuan first. Thank you, Esther. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I am a pharmacist by training but started my policy and uh, public health research journeys at the University of uh, New South Wales. So we are the same alumni as uh, With my PhD work on the first arm of national medicine policies, namely access to medicines. And uh, upon uh, the completion of my PhD, I was invited by the Harvard Chan School of Public Health to present my work at the third international conference for improving use of medicines in Turkey in 2011. My work was uh, highlighted both in the opening address and closing remarks and features in the official conference press release and adopted as the conference the recommendation for future research and actions. My work was subsequently uh, featured in a special report by Thomson Reuters in UK and used by the United Nations in their report and published as a book by the World Health Organization. And based on that success, I secured a postdoc position uh, at Quality Use of Medicine and Pharmacy Research Centers, University of South Australia, expanding my research to the second arm of a national medicine policies, which is quality use of medicine, uh, with a focus on older Australian populations. And I think the, the key 
turning point for me is when the Australian government launched the Boosting Dementia Research Initiative to attract talented scientists from other fields into dementia research in 2015. I took the uh, initiative and uh, seized the opportunities putting in my fellowship application. And this was uh, successful and I was awarded an NSMRC IRC Dementia Research Development Fellowship uh, to investigate the medicine inducing cognitive impairments and dementia. And since then, uh, I have instigated a large dementia research collaboration in the Asia Pacific where dementia is an emerging public health problems. And the collaboration is very successful. And I'm now the principal investigators on a number of competitive research grants, including three big international grants to develop Vietnam National Dementia Plans to build capacities for the next generations of Vietnamese dementia research leaders and to develop and test an eye support virtual assistant to empower and support dementia carers in Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Thank you. Great, thank you, Twan. It's yeah, definitely interesting to hear from um, how you kind of progress through all the different stages and yeah, the key turning points as well. Um, so next we'd like to hear from um, Catherine, maybe if you could give us a bit of a highlights and key turning points. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Stephanie and Tejo for inviting me. And uh, thank you, Belinda. It was an excellent um, first presentation. Um, it's interesting to hear what everyone else has been, uh, their journey. Um, my background is actually probably a little different to a lot of the, the group on board, but um, my background initially is in nursing. And so um, my career has been longer than I'd like to mention the years for. Um, but uh, through nursing, I guess, uh, you get an exposure to a range of different health issues. And primarily, I thought that the acute uh, side was very attractive. However, I, I over the first uh, decade of my career, gravitated to aged care and fell into, and I guess, in love with the process of understanding dementia and also supporting care. So... Um, through uh, nursing, you they have a number of different options and traditionally it's education and management. I, I actually um, did as much as I could in those, so I have degrees in management as well. But um, I then moved back towards the clinical side of work and became a nurse practitioner and specialising in dementia. Um, I guess um, working in a number of settings, um, including hospital, um, community, setting up services in the community, you get a very good understanding of um, the needs and in particular loved working within memory clinic services as well. Um, one of the turning points, I guess, for me was the association I developed with the Anglicare or the Anglican Retirement Villages at the time. Um, they recognised that they really were under-resourced in understanding what they needed to do for the community. And I spent uh, some good 10 years working with them to set up services for assessment, memory clinics that could run within their organisation, services of consultation so that they could better understand their population. And in doing so, simultaneously um, met with um, some fantastic research teams, part of the McCusker Alzheimer's Research Foundation, and set up uh, research within the retirement villages where, I guess, translating care is about taking the best research, the most promising possibilities, um, direct to the doors of the people who most need it. And also interestingly, are most likely going to advocate for this type of work. So um, through that, um, I probably received up to almost $2 million of funding through the, uh, the uh, research, for the research that I needed to, to undertake for my PhD. And um, that was primarily focused on dementia prevention um, using, um, using curcumin for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease, using the um, cognitive blood and also brain imaging biomarkers. So it was an amazing opportunity to do that um, and also learn from some amazing, um, very knowledgeable people within the field, obviously. But at the same time, recognizing that what I wanted to do was going to be bigger than that and setting up the um, CARA Mines or the CARA Institute of Neurological Diseases to take on board 
other promising pharmaceutical um, you know, opportunities for people. So we now run about uh, a dozen to um, 15 different clinical trials within that area here in Macquarie Park, just down the road from the university. And I have a team of really very um, dedicated and uh, excited researchers. Some of them have uh, a clinical background, others are from um, a university degree in, in science that uh, are wanting to apply their skills right at the uh, doorstep, I guess, of the population. So it's a really nice area to be working in. I learn every day something new. Um, I spend a lot more time in management, but still using my clinical skills and still able to, um, I guess, share that knowledge so that it can help those people in the community as well as grow new researchers and careers um, in doing so. So that's a little bit in the nutshell of what I'm doing. Um, it's, it's not far from Macquarie if anyone ever wants to drop in. And uh, we've been in operation now for seven years running clinical trials. So it's really exciting. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's really inspiring to hear how you kind of started from a lot of, uh, I guess, on the ground patient contact and then kind of took all of that feedback from the people um, and I guess, yeah, consumers and kind of applied that to your research and next steps in your career as well. So, yeah, really fascinating to hear that. OK, so next uh, we might hear from um, Tracy, if you like. Thanks, Stephanie. So, um, so Catherine, maybe not so different um, to me. I was listening to you going, oh, well, maybe not so different. So my background is actually physiotherapy. Um, and then I studied economics later on. Um, so, yeah, so I, I got interested in dementia. Um, really, like I, I worked as a, as a physio for, for about 20 years and I, I worked in hospitals and the, you know, I don't know what physio training's like now, but we literally got zero instruction in dementia or any sort of cognitive impairment, didn't understand anything about it. And the only thing I knew was that anyone diagnosed with dementia, we immediately refused them rehab and, you know, said they needed mm -hmm. to go to nursing home. So that was my experience. Um, and then I moved out into a community rehab team and, um, and I worked with some some really great occupational therapists and we had quite a comprehensive review program part of that was cognitive screening and I realized that you know maybe a third of these people we were seeing out in the community had um, cognitive impairment or undiagnosed dementia and nobody would even know um, because they were coping quite well um, up to a point obviously having some issues um, and so I got really interested in this and, and sort of thinking why did we exclude them from so many things um, and I started my PhD program, which is actually in falls research. But um, one of the things that was a bit different to my falls research is that I didn't exclude anyone on the basis of cognitive impairment, whereas all the previous falls research pretty much had been. Um, so we included them all. Um, and then we found that, that people um, generally responded just as well um, that were living in the community as, as those without. Um, so that was kind of where my, my interest started. And as I said, I'd, I'd studied economics as well, and we incorporated some health economics. And then I ended up um, getting a position at, at Griffith University. Um, and I guess some of these things were a bit serendipitous. Like I did, I was, did have that interest in dementia and I decided to go to the dementia conference and meet a few, um, you know, professors whose work I'd read and, you know, just sort of touch base and get some interest. But I just happened to be, um, with the health economist um, professor at Griffith, happened to be on a trans, you know, a MR, NHMRC grant with Sue Curl and some other researchers on a transition care program. Um, so he didn't have any particular interest in any of that. So put me on as the, the researcher to do all the work. And I ended up, you know, going along to all the CI meetings and, and getting quite involved in that team. Um, and that sort of led to then uh, the Cognitive Decline Partnership Centre um, bid that I was actually led the health economics stream in for five years. So, um, so I guess uh, you know a little bit of a little bit of luck and a little bit of going and meeting the right people and and interest in the area, um, and sort of led me you know down that that path. Um, so, the cognitive decline and uh, generally older people. Um, research around the, the measurement of quality of life and the, the health economics um, of care programs has sort of been where I've, I've ended up morphing into. Um, so, 
Yeah, so I've been working, I guess, for about 10, 12 years now um, as an academic, um, but still sort of maintaining some of that allied health background and, you know, linking quite closely with allied health people um, and, and their programs. So, yeah, so that's kind of a little nutshell. Thank you so much, Tracy. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to hear how you combine different fields to kind of carve out your own niche and um, you know, build up different areas of expertise that you're known for. Um, okay, great. So next we're going to hear from Suraj. Um, Raj. Thanks, Stephanie. And my story is somewhere between Belinda's story and Catherine's story, I think. And I relate to a lot of what Belinda said about moving sideways into so sort of different fields. I started off with a degree in psychology from UNSW and trained as a clinical psychologist. After my PhD, you know, I only published one systematic review from that. So I thought, okay, well, a research job's sort of impossible. I'm just going to go into the clinical space. And I worked as a clinical psychologist for six years. So I was doing three days a week as a clinical psychologist and also a day of music teaching, a day of lecturing. And that was sort of my life for six years. And while I was doing that, my PhD supervisor kept me employed on a casual basis to analyze all this data, big data she had from multiple countries. So I was lucky enough during my PhD to do some training in epidemiology and you know, structural equation modeling, and I was looking at predicting anxiety and depression in the population. So when she gave me the chance to keep working on these data sets, it's like, great, gave me something to do that was not clinical, that was still using the research skills, even if it was a couple of hours a week. And we managed to publish a couple of papers during those years. So when this job came up at Chiba to work in dementia research with the Henry Berdati, Perminder Sachdev, I said, well, why wouldn't you apply for that? So I thought, okay, let's just go and see what happens. And then ended up getting the job somehow. And I've been there for about two and a bit years now. It's been really exciting. I think to have that global access of data that Perminder's put together from Cosmic is just amazing from a clinician perspective, when you help someone one-to-one, -one, you often think like, how can I change something at a bigger scale? And so that's been so exciting. And I think for me, it's been really important to try to reach out to as many different people as possible. Like Belinda said, like I've reached out to people at UQ, Pravinda suggested, why don't you talk to them about developing some interventions? You have clinical skills. So we started talking about involving people living with dementia, their care partners to co-design a new social cognition intervention because I'd run social skills groups before for uh, personality disorders, for um, autism, I thought, well, why not do something like that for dementia? And while working on the epidemiology project with Henry, um, I put in a grant application for a pilot study for this co-design and I'd never seen a grant application in my life before. I didn't know what it looked like. I had to go and sit in the grant library and actually make notes of what are the paragraphs that go into a grant application? What are the headings that go into it? What kind of words do people use? And then I put something together and I was just really shocked when they said, you've got the grant. So over the last year we have done the pilot study and now I think I'm at the stage where we might apply for some RCT funding. So I don't know where this will take me, but it's been fun. Thank you so much, Suraj. Yeah, really, really good to hear. Um, yeah, so many different types of trajectories as well, um, because you know no one's path is is the same, really. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to all our panelists. We'll um, open up the floor for questions. Uh, I can see there's a question here from Nadika already. Let me just um, read that out, and I'll also invite Tejal to join us as well. Um, yeah, so Nadika asks, yeah, great to hear um, that it's okay to change directions in your career and and follow life 
life goals um, and that, you know, we can stop, evaluate our direction and, and kind of make those changes. But I think a lot of people um, can really struggle to make these um, changes because of fears or uh, other kind of life circumstances or other job insecurities. So do any of you have any advice on how to take that step and, and kind of take that risk? Yeah, yeah. You want to go first? I, I could probably comment because I went from, um, I mean, and it is scary, right? Like I had a, a permanent um, HP5 position in Queensland Health as a as a senior physiotherapist, and I and I moved from that to a research position that was actually lower paid and contract um, work, but I, I did it in in steps, I guess, because I didn't want to give up that permanent position that was quite. Yeah, it's like, well, you don't know if you're going to make a go of it. Or, um, so I actually was lucky enough that I could reduce to part-time um, in my permanent role. So I started um, as a part-time academic. Um, and after a couple of years um, of doing that, um, I realised that I probably, yeah, was secure enough that I could resign from my, my other position and, and continue on and but I think that's a that is a real issue particularly for health professionals when they're coming from you know secure jobs and you've got mortgages and families and it, it's it's a really difficult um thing but sometimes I guess you you've just got to back yourself um and know that you can step back like I've always sort of maintained my registration and um, maintain some interest in in physio research and enough sort of things to do to um to really stay in that field so that it's always my sort of fallback that I think I can go back if I need to. Okay, great. Belinda, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm just supporting what Tracy was saying that that shift from permanent to the gig economy is not is not a fun one. And a lot of research is done on limited contracts. Uh, one of the things I probably didn't mention that that uh, I put as an insurance sort of policy into my chopping and changing was I set myself up with my own ABN uh, so that I actually could have a sole trader identity and that enabled me to uh, do uh, contract work as well in my own right. There's a lot of uh, people out there who just want to hire someone for a small period of time. Uh, they're not necessarily in the university sector. So I did some work and that's how I continued to do the knowledge brokering for uh, the Sachs Institute because they paid me per brokering occasion but that kind of process could work in all sorts of ways um, so that that was something that was useful for me at the time and and may is maybe a consideration if that sort of freelancer role uh, appeals to you but yeah it's not easy we acknowledge that but sometimes you've just got to be brave and bold and just grab it and um, I think you're right Tracy back yourself yeah, Catherine, do you want to add to that? No, I think um, what I agree that the consultancy side of things, I, that never occurred to me until quite later in my career. And I did the same thing as Belinda, just so that you you, you can step in and out of a work, even if it's just a one-off um, consultancy fee, it's good for your track record and experience you learn from that. But the other thing is, um, uh, I think it's really very difficult. To, um, sometimes we have expectations that it's always going to be linear and upward. Um, and I don't know very many people that haven't had to take, um, you know, sometimes significant change. Um, sometimes it's initiated by a change in your, your private life, um, you know, or something that has um, uh, initiated you to rethink where you're at. And I think that's what's happened with COVID. But when I think back, I, I relocated to Sydney and I went from being a director of nursing in Victoria to a registered nurse in um, Sydney, just as a stepping stone and obviously a big difference there, but the, um, the change of role, it was a role in the community and more associated with dementia. And that probably was just luck rather than good management because not all decisions are clear and crystal to most people. It's sometimes just a door is open and why not? I've got nothing else to focus on at the moment. So you take it and then it leads to somewhere else. Oh, Tan, do you want to add to that? Yeah, actually, it's, uh, from my own experience, because I, I, I am originally from Vietnam. And uh, I started with um, my job in pharmaceutical industry. I, uh, I own my, my own companies. I opened my own companies, and it's very profitable. And uh, I thought that I would stick with that, you know, 
but then uh, follow my heart and I went to the university to be a lecturer, faculty members in pharmacoeconomics and pharmaceutical management. Then, uh, then you know, it just continued with the new development. Then I went, came here to do my uh, PhD. Then, you know, so I think the, the main thing here is um, follow your heart, follow, follow your passion, because sometimes what you have now might be the best for you if you don't try another things. Hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> definitely yeah. Keep in mind um, your own goals and what works for you, and but also sometimes just go with the flow. I think is is the general theme of the answer. Uh, we have some more questions popping up, um, so let's have a look. Thanks, Steph. Um, there is a couple of questions, um, but just before I uh, speak out the question, um, I would just like to remind everyone to ask as many questions as possible. We have got a wonderful panel uh, and advisors, and uh, at least for me, it's just the right things I need to hear today. So uh, please go ahead and uh, ask those questions. So um, there's a question from Marianne Coleman. I'm writing a rope statement at the moment. I spent several years uh, supporting professors to write their grants and complete their research. My recent uh, publication record spans things from cancer to value-based recruitment. I have only been working in dementia research for a couple of years. So what, what's the to your top tips for turning a fractured publication record into a positive one? Who would like to go first? I can start the ball rolling here. Um, <laughs> yeah. my, my publication track record is, uh, in, in most respects, a dog's breakfast. Um, it, it really covers so many dimensions and has peaks and troughs. And uh, it, it looks like it was uh, four different CVs meshed into one. And uh, in the early days, when I wasn't thinking as strategically, but I was more thinking, how do I help the team? Because I was working in hospital situations where a lot of the staff I was working with had no understanding of research processes, had never published before. I was doing highly generous things as well, which was, well, this is your world. I'll write up the paper, I'll do all the research, but I'll put you as first author and I'll go second or third. So my track record has got weirdness in it according to whether or not I was first author and whether that mattered, because that matters in some disciplines like psychology more than it matters in other disciplines like medicine where being last seems to be the prestige role. So trying to write about that in a way that a grant reviewer at 3 a.m. in the morning is looking for reasons to cull grants rather than push you forward is a tricky art form. So I usually had to write my track record to distill the bits and pieces out of it that pushed forward the skills that I was claiming to have uh, so rather than worrying that it, whether or not it focused on dementia, I might be talking about stakeholder engagement or, or some other or a technique uh, like um, uh, some kind of action or co-design thing. That was more important about the paper rather than whether dementia was in the title or something similar. So that's how I pulled together was I had to know my own threads because I certainly wasn't going to rely on someone else looking at my track record to know the threads and, and, and write, do the rope. So you, you've almost got to study yourself, I think, and identify your threads and know why you are in dementia and what you've brought from these other fields in there and highlight those things. That's my best advice, I think. Sympathy, a bit of empathy and a bit of practical advice. Great uh, um, advice, uh, Belinda. And I also think it might be really helpful uh, when you mentioned specifically that what skills you are bringing um, when you started first as a dementia researcher, maybe ex try to expand your skills by you know, collaborating with other like-minded researchers outside um, your little group and then see how that goes as well. So that when you want to take on the lead, you have got those networking and collaborative um, opportunities as well. Um, to one, oh, did you want to have a go? Yeah, I just want to add uh, uh, on the Belinda's comments. Uh, actually, sir, I, I couldn't agree with Belinda more. Um, you know, because uh, for, 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 for example, my own experience, 
I had nothing to do with dementia so when I put in my fellowship application for dementia research. And because all I did in my PhD is about the access to medicine, about the pricing policy, you know, pharmacoeconomics things, and nothing to do with dementia. But, you know, the main thing here is you have to articulate what you have done previously, showing your, you know, your skill set and transferable skill into the new uh, proposal. Then uh, I tried to articulate my work, my previous work in pharmaceutical policy, in access to medicine, as saying that it is the first arm of a national medicine policy. And now I move to the second arm of the national medicine policies, which is quality use of medicine. Then, because I have some experience working in the Austrian, the older Austrian population, then, you know, link from the older Austrian population to the Austrian uh, people with dementia. So that's kind of like the way you link and articulate what you have done before with your current proposal. That's a great way of uh, taking your work to the next level. Um, uh, so we've got uh, a similar question that, do you have any tips in preparing job or grant applications when you have had a career break from research working, for example, predominantly clinically and uh, or a late start in the research field uh, and uh, how to speak wonders of it and maximize your chances. So Suraj, uh, yeah, oh, would love to hear your advice on that. So I guess from my perspective, try to reach out to some mentors. I've been very lucky to have Louise Mewton at Chiba as a mentor. So someone who's a few years ahead of you where you think you'd you'd like to be one day, who's maybe not too high up, would be a good choice of mentor. I think try to get example applications from them and have an honest discussion with yourself about what do you do bring? Like everyone said here, you're applying for something for a reason. There's some skill that you have that's transferable that you can bring into the project, especially clinical skills. I mean, that knowledge that you have of what actually helps people and being able to bring the client's perspective into the research, that's something quite unique and a lot of researchers don't do that. So, you know, think about co-design, think about the way to involve the community and about communicating results to a broader audience and doing something that's maybe an intervention or something that's translatable because as a clinician, that's, that's where our skills are. And great idea to just maximize that as much as possible. Great, and um, also it's sometimes uh, important to ask our colleagues where they think we are shining as I think we are sometimes our worst critics as well. Um, yeah, so uh, yes, Catherine. Um, I will, I, I want to mention one thing is, and, and, and I guess it more relates to applying for positions. Um, there are, as we say, you know, a lot of people moving positions, but there's also a lot of competition when it comes to um, applications. And um, again, even where it's similar to grants, um, you, you're looking at a, at a lot of applications and trying to work out whether or not someone looks like they're, they're, they're genuinely looking to contribute or just as a stepping stone. And I, I say this as, a, as an employer, um, it's, it's difficult. You, you want to have a stable team for at least, you know, uh, a reasonable amount of time, be it 18 months, two years, where you feel like you haven't just used all your resources to train someone into a role, um, only for them to use that as a, you know, you know, three to six months stepping into another job somewhere else because you help them enable that. Um, there's a balance, I think, that has to be had from from career growth and also understanding that while we acknowledge that people will move from position to position often, and that is tends to be the, um, the pattern now, there still needs to be a track record of, of, of um, I guess, a commitment to whatever people take on board. And that's what an employer is looking for, some level of commitment for a, you know, a, a genuine, reasonable time and being open and honest about that um, in that instance is important. Secondly, um, persistence. Um, you, you need to shine. So um, every, if you don't hear um, from, from uh, an application, um, you reach out and you reach out again if you need to because 
it may have been that you're just been unlucky with timing because um, that can happen within business as well. So um, don't don't give up easily. Yeah, great points, Catherine. And um, this is really highlighting the the importance of really good mentorship. And I know there was a couple of questions um, in the chat box about mentorship. And I think Nadika has just posted a link, but here's here's a plug for our um, AdNet mentorship program, which we run, um, which you know links up mentors and mentees throughout Australia. So there's a yearly intake. Um, but yeah, so definitely keep an eye out on um, the uh, AdNet Accelerator Researcher Group page um, where the information um, can be found. Um, and then next we have a question from Michelle um, about um, juggling everything and transitioning into a leadership role. I think um, we already heard from Belinda saying, you know, you've got more hats than fit your head. You've got so many things to juggle. What do you have any advice on, um, you know, how to juggle all these commitments, especially um, if you're in the life stage of having a young family as well? Mm. Can I just say that if you're juggling things to move into leadership, you won't stop juggling things when you're a leader. <laughs> <laughs> it's a commitment to juggling, I'm afraid. It's, uh, it's what's required um, because as, as I've moved up, particularly in the university system, I'm being pulled into all sorts of different advisory groups and committees. It, it goes with the task. Um, so whatever works for you is something you're going to take with you as if your children are little, they'll become teenagers, they'll still be demanding, you'll, or you'll have a dog or, or something like that, something's going to happen. Uh, so I don't have any real tips or tricks there. I just want to do a backwards comment to the, the one about jobs. Um, as an employer, just building on what Catherine was saying, uh, I do serious conversations with referees for people who apply for roles. So your job application gets you to an interview. Your interview is your business, how you do that. That's your performance. But if you've been shortlisted, make sure your referees are telling the same story that you are. So if they see, if you think it's an asset, you're bringing clinical into a research after a career break, make sure they know about it because I will definitely ask if I'm an employer. That didn't answer the juggling question though. Just thought I'd say that. <laughs> All right. um, does anyone else have anything to add to the juggling question? Yeah, Tracy. Yeah, I think it's, you know, that's all, something I think we all struggle with. Um, and it's a constant struggle. But I, I think some of the things, you know, everyone has a to do list, but it's actually good to also have a stop doing list. Um, so there are things that you may have signed up for, or you thought were, you know, and you kind of, you tend to just keep doing them, but perhaps they're not the best use of your time. So it's good to go through and, you know, do a real diary check and go exactly what is on here, sort it all into, you know, what do I actually want to do? What am I really good at? What are the things that perhaps aren't, you know, so important and so critical? And are they things that I can actually stop doing to free up that space? But yeah, it's, it's constant for all of us, isn't it? I love that idea that the stop doing list. Yeah, I'm going to have to add to that. <laughs> So I'm going to I'm going to add the to do list. So the stop doing list to my to do list and hope I get around to it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, okay, so we're getting to the second stage of um, our um, workshop today actually I uh, think just looking at the time um so yeah as a reminder the second stage we're going to be uh moving into breakout rooms um and so we can have I guess more of an intimate discussion with um I think each of our panelists will be um leading one of one of the groups um so I can see there's 52 people here so hopefully we can get a good um kind of random split of everyone um but before we go um I do also have a poll for everyone which I'm just going to start here um if everyone can um if you can see that hopefully you can see that um it's just a poll about today's um session um so just a bit of feedback um yeah um if you want to fill that out and then we're going to have a very quick break while we sort everyone into the rooms um and then once everyone's in their rooms um I, 
hopefully you can um, turn your cameras and mics on and we can all have have a chat about um, more specific questions you might um, want to discuss about kind of career yeah. progression and um, dementia research. Can I, I need to say my goodbye, sorry, yes, probably. I did I did put it behind the scenes that I actually am called into another meeting which I can't not go, <laughs> so I've given you all the time and effort that I can, it's been a privilege to be here, uh, lovely to hear again from some of those panellists, some are new to me, some are old, so I apologise to people who thought they were going to be in a breakout session with me I actually can't stay I've got to be at a two o'clock meeting very very got to go <laughs> well thank you so much Belinda for, for coming and sharing your insights I really love to have you here um great Thanks. thank you bye, thank Belinda. You, Belinda. Yep. great so so we're just gonna awkwardly sit here until we get sorted into the rooms um I'll give it another few minutes um I know I know some people do have to leave um so yeah once you finish the poll um we'll wait till um we have the final number of people before we divide everyone into the groups um and I will continue chatting here awkwardly <laughs> <laughs> we just have an upcoming webinar um on parenting in dementia so I'll just quickly share my screen so it's um going to be uh run on oh um on the 26th of July, and uh, 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 please look out for the registration details.